I was walking down the street after I'd smoked. I was walking down the street and I saw a guy who hadn't seen me in a while because I was actually in the Department of Juvenile Justice. So uh, he's like, yo, man, where you been? I ain't seen you in a while. Where you been? I said, I'm doing community service. He said, well, how many hours do you have? And I said, 80. And he and, and in my mind, the word 80 just kept echoing over and over. It was 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. Just 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. That's kind of how my symptoms begin. And it just transitioned into me believing that I could have conversations with people in my brain. At the age of about, at the age of 16, I had just turned 16. I had just gotten to a point where I was um, functioning with the voices. It was a part of my life at this point. Around the same time, I'm having this conversation with my mom in this third world, what I thought to be third world. And she says, Lloyd, my boyfriend has a problem. Can you help him? And I'm like, you know, what's the problem? She said, well, he wants to die, but he doesn't want to kill himself. Can you help? And for me, it was instantaneous. Sure, I can do it, no problem. I go upstairs and my mother says she could hear me coming up the stairs because I was talking. At this time, even though I had the holster on my hip, I did have the firearm in my back pocket. I walk into her room, I go over to talk to her. She was sitting on her bed at the head of the bed and her boyfriend was at the foot of the bed brushing his hair. And I pointed the firearm and I shot twice in his direction. He was shot once in the head, once in the neck. And as a result of the shots, he did pass away. My mother's, you know, she's upset. So she walks up to me and she's hit me, you know, and screaming at the same time. And she got on the phone. And I just remember at that point, um, her saying, my son did it. And it was like, at that point, my heart just sunk. It's one of the harder things to live with these days. I have a eight year old daughter. Uh, and she is the absolute, she's the absolute best thing that's ever happened to me. I share my story as much as I do because if, if I can help someone keep their daughter, their father, their son, if I can help that, then I feel like I owe that to my community at this point. I owe that. Shortly after, same night, I was incarcerated I spent the next three months in lockup. Lockup is seclusion, 23 hours a day lockup, one hour out a day in shackles and handcuffs to clean your room, make a phone call and take a shower. Here I am in lockup and the voices for me are louder than they've ever been. Now, there was this one correctional officer, she would come by and she would talk to me and she, would, she wouldn't she would talk to me, she would listen to all of this stuff I had to say. I know it was exhausting, because she would just kind of, she would just lean up against the door like this while I was talking. So I knew she was exhausted, but she would listen. Listen without any type of judgment or any type of despising who I am as a person. Um, she'd listen and she said, you know, that's helpful what you're going through. And, and her exact words were, you don't have to do this alone, is what she said. I, I can say that that was a, a huge pivotal moment for me, just having someone to care about me. So back in 2004, I became a certified peer support specialist, uh, and I worked for the uh, South Carolina Department of Mental Health for 14 and a half years in doing so as well. And in doing peer support, peer support is uh, meeting with people one-on-one, -on -one, meeting with people um, in group settings, meeting with people in their families, uh, meeting with people in their psychiatrists or psychologists. Um, and, and we stand as a bridge almost uh, because as I have these conversations with other people who are living in recovery, I realize that many of our experiences, both with mental illness and um, outside of mental illness, have been similar. Whether it be financial strain or relationships or schooling, it's similar. So we can connect in a, in a very different way. Going into peer support, I think I was struggling with 
who I was. I didn't I didn't have enough space in between the experiences that I had as a teenager and the experiences I had as a free adult to really identify myself as anything else. I saw myself as that young guy from Georgetown, South Carolina. So being a peer support specialist really helped me identify that it's okay to live in recovery. It's okay to take care of myself the way I need to and, and to be that as I am moving around. So I can live in recovery and just that alone, I'm not even talking about opening my mouth, just living in recovery alone was inspiring other people who were living in recovery.